Hello, hello. I want to make a video today in the same series. What is true love? I have a lot to say about this subject and every day I can dig up stuff out of my own life that demonstrates in, in examples what I'm talking about and why and how we can fix it. I suffered so we can learn, okay? And um, I woke up today, this morning, with a very sour feeling and a sour expression in my face, to say the least. And um, a bunch of stuff surfaced again from the past. Waldorf School came into my conscious awareness. Waldorf School, designed by Rudolf Steiner, meant to be perfect, the perfect school and all of this. And so a lot of things that are great in it, but he made some serious mistakes that he just didn't know, you know. He didn't foresee this, the consequences of his planned ideal curriculum that he thought was going to help people and was going to integrate people and make the community work well together. I don't know how it's working out today. I haven't visited Waldorf School in a long time, so maybe things are doing better. And I think it is the same with, this, with any political system. Any political system would work perfectly if the people that constitute this political system, not just the governing people, but everyone, the voters, the, the peasants, the, the populist body, all together, you know, if they functioned well, if they behaved well, if they were altruistic, then every single system would work. Every church would work. Every um, religion would work if people behaved themselves. You know, if if there wasn't someone who pushed themselves in front of others and elbowed the others away and took all the sunflower seeds for himself which the squirrel did earlier. The squirrel came up to the blue jay and and the way the squirrel jumped over right over to the r jumped right at that blue jay and the blue jay fluttered off very fast and this, the squirrel was like the squirrel was eating together with the blue jay first you know it was all working well but then this, the the squirrel thought no now he wants it all for himself, the entire bird feeder. So he jumps right at the blue jay, blue, blue jay flutters off, the squirrel sits there, and the squirrel says, nope, like this, nope, this is mine. <coughs> huh? What are you thinking? Nope, just like, 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 you, like it's nothing, like just you're claiming your own possessions <coughs> back. You know, that's how the squirrel, and not in a mean way, but like in a, in a resolute way, you know, like, nope, that's mine. And that is what I see in humans, of course. They're not different than the wild animals. You know. They behave the same way. I guess I need to let babes out. So, I guess I'm getting a little better with my OCD now. I used to not be able to touch the doorknob, and now I did, and I didn't wash my hands afterwards, so that's pretty cool. So I have a, a very intense clean freak streak, and it is OCD, it's OCD's mental illness, and it's based on irrationality. And all of this ties also into this and, uh, and ties right into the bullying issue that I'm getting to in a short time. So 
Anyway, Waldorf School. If the constituents of Waldorf School or any school are functioning in an altruistic way, then it would be a perfect school. But it's only a perfect school if there are perfect people in it, right? And perfect teachers and so on. Pe teachers that don't have issues cooking underneath. So, and I didn't luck out when I went to Waldorf school. The te most teachers, it was like, it appeared to me to be like 95% of the teachers that we had had some real serious mental illness. And because of that, how, you know, that's how are they going to be there to protect someone from being bullied, right? If they have mental illness and, and severe neurotic issues cooking underneath and all kinds of hefty, hefty, hefty things. The humiliation issues and insensitivities and insecurity and you name it. I mean, just un, an, a whole scale of of mental illness issues, and that are that are not touched, that are never touched at all, that that are never faced. You know, they're, they're, that are played over, acted out, egoically pushed under the rug, and so on, and then extreme ego issues because of this someone accidentally touching on the issue that is so inflamed under the rug that will just create an explosion. That's how it was with my grandfather also and my mother. And um, my dad, he had, he had, he had a thicker rug laying <laughs> over the stuff. That's all. So, yeah, but the teachers in the Waldorf school, I mean, it was it was a complete and utter, I don't want to call it a failure, but it was um, utterly wrong basis for me to go to school as a child. And then first I went to the public school because they, they didn't have a space for me. I was, my generation had just too many kids all of a sudden and too many kids that wanted to go to Waldorf school. So I had to go to a public school first and as I already said I was, uh, I was enrolled too soon and that caused all these problems. So they thought that there was something wrong with me and that's why they brought me to Waldorf school but there wasn't anything wrong with me. I was just too sensitive for the world. And not only was all of this way too overwhelming and way uh, the, the, the teacher in the public school was really nice. You know, she was great if it was only for her, if, if it was her and 10 mm. other children or nine other children who were like me, <coughs> sensitive and all of this, then it would have been perfect. But now I got I came to Waldorf school, which was like it, it, it's kind of like um, shattering out a dropping water by turning on a machine gun, something like this. Yeah. So I just got from worst to worst. So in the Waldorf school, they had double as many kids in the school class, 40 kids in one school class. The air in the, in the class was terrible. I remember that horrible smell of used up air and they wouldn't even open the window. And my husband, he told me that he experienced the same thing when he was a child. And the teachers were horrific and I was bullied and nobody helped me and it was just a total disaster. And the what happens when someone is bullied, I mean, it was so bad that several times I remember in, in the, the pauses between the classes, 
I was standing by the window and the light from the window would all of a sudden black out in front of my eyes and, and things were blacking out and I heard like a, it sounded like a semi truck running over me and um, several times this happened where I passed out for just a, a few seconds where my knees gave in and, and I slumped down on the floor and then I felt even more vulnerable when that happened and and then my fight and flight system kicked in and I and I pushed myself back up to stand up again and I remember it, it was just everything every impression the the entire energy in that school was so incredibly negative and thick and heavy and and exhausting and it was it was so taking you know instead of giving it was the opposite of giving it was the opposite of altruism and the opposite of love and not in the sense of Rudolf Steiner at all uh, quite the opposite but it's again it's, it's the people it is the people that make up the system that it's the people in the system that make the system go in the right direction or in the wrong direction. But Rudolf Steiner didn't know these consequences of mixing Christianity into the the Gnosticism and the the Far Eastern philosophies. He mixed it, tried to mix that all together in order to create peace. That was his agenda which I understand he meant well, but it just shot backwards because then a bunch of Christians were enrolled in that school because it was the only school that offered Christian Bible schooling and stuff like this. And even though I was in the in the alternative class, alternative from religion, because my parents are not religious, even though I was in that other class, they were teaching these, they were teaching Bible stories and, and other Gnostic tales from that were from old Babylon and stuff like this, and that made absolutely no sense. It had no reference to the present day life of a child and the problematics a child faces and so on. So the public schools were a whole lot better in the curricula that they offered in this in this regard particularly for you know, making sense and that's exactly what Rudolf Steiner was trying to do. He was trying to to have this encompassing all encompassing approach, you know, this approach of bringing culture and sensitivity and all of this together so that the child feels more liked and loved, but it actually did the opposite. And that's why if I had a kid, I would never send my kid to a Waldorf school, ever. You know, it, it is, it, it's horrible absolutely horrible. You know, it, it depends if the teachers are good then things would be well but the, the whole system is set up in a way that it can derail very easily you know, given that people have their religiousness and their dogmaticism and there's the egoic mindset and all of this and the, and the greediness and the selfishness and the elbow behavior and the bullying and sadistic people so I had a bunch of sadistic people in that class in that Waldorf school class a lot of those kids were from rich parents and because that there was a private school that had to be paid not public, which is free in Germany. Public universities are also free in Germany. So, but this particular school that went all the way to, um, to 
to the graduation, which, which is about equivalent to one year of college. And I had to quit that school when I was 16. I made the conscious decision that I was finally, it was dawning on me that this is not good for me at all. And I also didn't like the, the mixed school. I wanted to go to a girl's school. So I went to the last girl's school that existed in that. And that was also, those were also the last two or three years that the girl's school was still a girl's school. So after that, there were, was no more girl's school. And I felt so much better being just around girls than having guys in the room. And the way the girls behaved, particularly the bully girls, the way they behaved with guys, with, with boys in the room, was very obnoxious. And they were particularly sadistic and, and cruel to those who had no self-esteem. And that was me, of course. I had absolutely zero self-esteem. And that also because of the history I already experienced with my grandfather and my mother not being able to be there, not being able to feel me and my needs and, and what, what, I, what, what was necessary to make me feel safe as a highly sensitive person that I am. And so I already, I was already extremely overwhelmed, and and then in that situation in the Waldorf school, the the kids that are cruel, they pick up right away. They see it right away when somebody is already overwhelmed and suffering. They'll they'll pick on that particular person who is already suffering, is already down and out, is already confused, is already not grounded with then herself or himself, you know, the person who is highly sensitive, the person who is vulnerable, the person who might likely not defend herself, and the person with, with no self-esteem. So this thing, no self-esteem, is, is really a trigger for, for predatory humans. It seems to be in the wild too, it's like, Predatory animals, they sense that when an, when an animal is injured and vulnerable and overwhelmed. So that's the first one they can get and they can eat. And that's the same principle with people. When they see someone vulnerable, they will take full advantage of that person. And people have always taken advantage of me. They have stolen stuff from me. Uh, I even have been beaten and kicked and girlfriends would take my boyfriends and boyfriends would be cruel to me by bringing a new date over to my house and so on. It just goes on and on and on and on like this. and. It's a bit overwhelming. I had that's why I had two times in my life where I thought uh, I can't handle it anymore. I can't handle the cruelty anymore. Particularly, what bothers me the worst is when I see vulnerable beings being abused, beings that cannot defend themselves with a lawyer or you know that beings who have nobody there to stand up for them. And that's the, the rabbits and, and the foxes and the raccoons and the horses and all the other animals. And, and also children and, and, and women in the third world countries. All of this bothers me a whole lot. So people being, animals being exploited and people and all of this, you know, where I thought, okay, this is too much, I can't handle it at all. So I have to do an exit. No. And uh, hap I was many times at that threshold. Uh, I can't count it anymore how many times I was at the threshold, but I actually attempted it two times. 
And it was very scary, very frightening, very, very frightening. It was so frightening. It, it's, I can't put it into words, no. particularly the last time uh, in 2013, like April or May 2013. Yeah, when I overdosed was Pierre's Japonica. That was very, 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 very frightening. But I fixed it myself with charcoal and the people in the hospital, they didn't know what to do. They didn't fix anything. I fixed it myself. So uh, all of these experiences, they lead me to conclude that the world I live in, I, I don't have too many people around me who set a ground for work for, for my life in order for me to 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 feel better and and thrive, you know. So I have to actually figure out a way how to create my own safe haven and my own healing cures and my own therapy and so on you know all the therapies i have done they are so flaky and so lopsided and so on dangerous very dangerous so but they were stepping stones more than anything else they were they were flimsy stepping stones flimsy bridges that basically collapsed behind me and I just barely made it to the other shore so there's no wha no stepping back there's no looking back there's only looking forward and figuring out ways to improve to make it better for other people for other beings to make it better for other suffering beings, animals and humans. The humans are the ones who are neurotic, not the animals. The animals become a bit neurotic when they live with neurotic people, of course. But it is the people who need the healing. And when the people, because the people are the caregivers, the caregiver needs the healing, so the caregiver can be there and give care to the children, which are the animals. They are children. We have that obligation here on Earth. We have hands, arms, legs, feet, and we have a brain that somewhat works somewhat yeah. let's make it work better that's what I'm that's that's what I'm trying to propagate with this video let's make our brain work better and we can do better and when we do better then we can use our hands arms legs and feet to to really create something there will be of quality and help for all living beings around us. For the animals, the birds out there that are eating, the sunflower seeds, and the squirrels, and the horses, and the dogs, and the giraffes, and the rhinos, and the elephants. <coughs> so that we can create a safe haven for all of them, so that that we can heal people and we can create things in a way that will protect and shield, not leave vulnerable beings, animals or kids out there to their own elements. And um, particularly if we continue that neurotic life cycle with humans, how are we ever going to get into the position where we can be the, the stewards of planet Earth? So n very few people make it through 
such drastic bullying from family and 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 other students. So very few people make it through. Most of them die. Most of them commit suicide and or en end up taking harsh drugs and killing themselves with that or alcohol, you know. And uh, smoking is a drug as well. It's a very, very addictive drug. And it's a killer too. It's a slow killer. So when I woke up today, I was thinking about the bullying that I have suffered from in school when I was seven to 16. And that, that was the time when I went to s Waldorf school. Severe, severe bullying that I have endured. And psychological bullying, not uh, not so much physical. In the beginning it was physical. I was bullied by boys and I was um, molested by boys that were a few years older than me. And that was very frightening and scary and, and very, very awful. It was a, a extremely horrific. I felt like I wanted to die. and. And then later, I was bullied by the girls psychologically, and that was it. It it hit the knife into the same wound that I already had, uh, the same wound of, of of feeling insecure, and embarrassed, humiliated, ashamed. You know, shame is shame is a feeling that I see a lot in the world shame feelings and people who just continue to shame people continue on with the shaming and a lot of them have been shamed themselves then they they cover that up and then they shame others always in the attempt to make themselves feel better and to feel more secure and <laughs> it's an illusion but they do it out of that reason and I don't quite understand the the real sadistic people. That is, I have a hard time with that. The real sadistic people and the, the psychopath and, and sociopathic people. Those are the ones I do, I have a real hard time really understanding it cognitively, what's going on there. I think it's just a, a to complete lack of empathy that they have in their brains. Mm. The need to hurt someone else probably comes from the need to make themselves feel better. And um, th the fact that they acted out means that they don't have empathy in the brain, that the, the formation for empathy is not existent. So they don't understand that this, what they're doing, is actually very, very painful for that other living being, whether it's a rabbit or, or a, a human. It's very difficult for me to understand, and I had those type of people in my class in Waldorf school, and. I did not know how to cope with this at all, neither did the teachers, and it was just extreme torture for me, and it, cr it completely sabotaged my life further than it was so actually meant to do. You know, Waldorf school was actually meant, my parents meant well. They, paid money to that school. They wanted me to have a, have a, a better teachers, a better school, better better integrated system of learning, and it was exactly the opposite, actually. They should have kept me in the other school. They should have, I should have just gone to a class under or one underneath that, and, they, and I w didn't want to go to the class under that. So when I did not get to the next level, I, they sent me back to the, to the same level when I was six. So I, I had to go to the first class twice, and I didn't want to do this, and I cried. And 
but they shouldn't give in so easily with this. They should just be nice to me. The teachers have such a... The teachers need to really be psychotherapists. They need to be trained as psychotherapists. All teachers. That should be mandatory. They should have the counseling certificate because that's what it really is. That's what it really boils down to. Being a teacher is having a huge responsibility for the, for the people that are dependent on them. And dependent not just for learning, for their whole lives. For their, for their lives physically and psychologically and for the, for the unfolding of their entire lives. For the becoming, you know, it is a becoming process. When that is disturbed, when that is ne neglected, it will have extreme consequences for that person later on. Like I said, I know people who have died from heroin overdose because they just could not possibly cope with that kind of stress was that kind of humiliation and bullying and this and and this discouragement that they felt in this process they felt like they were the failures a child will never question the adults i mean it's a, in a very rare cases my husband was one of those rare cases of children who questioned the adults I was way too timid to question adults. It didn't feel right, any of that. It felt bad, but I couldn't really put my finger on it, where and what. I just knew it felt wrong. But I d couldn't cognitively really understand it. I was way not, not developed yet for that. My cortex, cortical areas were not developed into the, the cognitive thinking processes. That started very late with me. That, that came way later. It was very slow, dragging, and also because of the emotional pain, that prolonged it even further. So the first time I started to actually do some real serious thinking is was after, when after I graduated with a really low grade, I just barely made it through. I'm amazed I even did make it through. So, just barely made it through this and, and I was so confused and fogged up and all of this. And then after that, little by little, slowly, I started to question things. I started to question my grandfather. And I I did. I worked for him in the stamp business after my school and during the graduation months with my girlfriends together. And my grandfather bullied me again while I was working there for him. And then, then all of a sudden, after I gra graduated, I was still helping my aunt out with it, with the auctions. And I liked working for my aunt and my uncle, but not for my grandfather. And so my grandfather bullied me again, and at some point I just said to my aunt, I can't continue this anymore. He, he'll just continue to bully me. And that's when, I, that's when I really understood that there's something really badly wrong with my grandfather and that I have to stay away from him. Yeah, and then at 26 I left and I went to L.A. And I only saw him one more time. After three months I had to come back to extend my visa and I saw him a few times in those two weeks that I was back there to take care of my dog. My dog died in that time. It was all very, very horrible, horrible for me to deal with, more than I could take. And my grandfather bullied me again and then I just knew I, I was never going to see him again, ever. And then a couple of years later, he finally died. He, w he was o way over 90. And bullies often get old. It's also the ego that can't let go. You know? It's like 
they're extremely egoic and the ego just can't let go the ego is very um, like everything has to be bordered like I s said yesterday everything has to be clear cut bordered bordered off bordered bordering here border on always um, everything has to be has to be planned but without without yeah everything is linear and dual dualistic and and it 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 is resistant in its own creation process so it's it's a it's a very rigid and very limited and resistant way of living and they resist death they resist all of this but they resi resisted their entire lives so they resisted life and bypassed life altogether because of this. Can you imagine a life of 95 years of resisting and not allowing and not being in a flow and not being with art and flow, being against art. You know, everybody who was doing art was doing modern art. He was against. Yeah, he even made fun of this, this artist who was about 10 years older than him, a famous artist, Kurt Schwitters, okay, he was one of the Dadaistic artists, became fame, world famous, and my grandfather knew him, and they were, I think, they were in the same school together, and they were in the same youth camps or something together, and Kurt Schwitters was doing his Dadaistic art already as a teenager. And my grandfather typically, as the other ones, bullied him because he didn't understand it, because it was going against his linearity. It, it was stepping on his egoic feet. That's what Kurt Schwitters did. Because Kurt Schwitters was an, a free butterfly, and my grandfather was not free. He was, he was a prisoner of his own linearity and his own resistance and he was a my grandfather was a terrible bully and if he thinks he can be a bully then he it feels less vulnerable so it's uh, some uh, kind of real bizarre egoic defense mechanism very warmongering of course very very conservative, reactionary, pro-death penalty, of course. My dad always accused my grandfather of ha having an attitude of chop the head off. And that's what it really was. Um, I mean, everything, sexist, speciesist, fascist, racist, everything. He got everything going old school, the oldest of the oldest, and it's pathetic and pitiful, and I was always ashamed of being related to him, I was ashamed of ha having his name, and that's why I'm thinking about changing my name to Redwood, so I really don't like my name I don't even want to mention my name my last name because it's uh, it's um, it's actually embarrassing <laughs> sounds a little bit like groupy you know so uh thank you very much I'm going to eventually change that name officially and uh, have been still using it occasionally just out of habit but I'm going to change that name. So from now on, I'm, I'm just going to sign all of my articles with Nicola Redwood. That's what I'm going to do from now on. Because it sounds a whole, whole lot better. I like Nicola. My mother, my mother chose the right name. It's a beautiful name. Particularly that it has an A in the end instead of the E, instead of that French version that had been oversold like uh, 
oversold like a like a cheap perfume so uh, the Nicola sounds a little bit more it sounds more tomboyish it sounds smarter it sounds more aristocratic I guess but I don't care if people call me Nicole <laughs> some people they have a hard time with that A in the end I don't care about that so or Nikki is okay too so I'm, I'm getting used to Nikki again I, for a long time I shied away from that because that's how my parents and my grandfather called me my grandfather so I would have preferred to have have a very official kind of contact to him. I even said the official you to him. In German we have two types of yous. We have the official one, that uh, the distant one, which is Z, and the personal one, which is du, which resembles the you. And in English you don't have that differentiation. It makes things a whole lot easier, by the way. Because in a lot of cases in the German language people don't even know how to address that other person. Some people are some kind of in-between and you don't know what to say. You feel like either version feels wrong. And with my grandfather, the, the personal you definitely felt wrong. So one time I said the official you to him and, and that really made him mad. And then he said the official you to me back and, and was yelling at me and screaming and who. Yeah, uh, and that's that was basically that that was the end of when I was helping him in the stamp business. So he really he really chased me out of there, and I was helping and I was I was really doing a good job and I was serving the customers with stamps to look at the stamps before the auction, and we were constantly running and running and running all day long, running and 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 dragging heavy boxes and so on and putting everything back where it belonged and doing this very diligently but my grandfather had to chase me out but but the worst part was in Waldorf school when I had these very sadistic girls in that class and so that I've been thinking about this for many years and and then I and and then my my warrior comes out inside of me and that says I should have just clubbed them down. I just I I should have just taken a, a crowbar and clubbed their brain out. That's what I should have done. And then the Buddhist scholar in me comes into life and and raises his head and says wait a minute wait a minute we have learned better than that you know you wanna you wanna cross out everything you've learned for your last 49 years and then the rationality kicks in and says yeah you're right i um that would be foolish and that's also not the solution. It's not a solution at all. It would have made me feel better in that moment, a whole lot better. You know, I would have gone to prison, I would have gone to uh, a different detention for difficult teenagers and so on, but I would have had, it would have completely set a completely different rail for my life. I would have from then on, I would have had a higher self-esteem, and I would have left my parents sooner, and I would have gone somewhere else sooner, and I would have maybe had to survive on the streets somewhere and become street smart, And but ha at least I would have built up a self-esteem. So, no. That was not my route. And I may have also been killed. And I mean, no telling. So it would either way, it would not have been the right decision. It would not have been the right route for me. Besides the point that it is unethical and that violence is never the solution. Never. Okay. Never. It is. We need to become crystal clear about this. 
violence is a short circuit in the in the prefrontal cortex. When the prefrontal cortex is bypassed, when there's a short circuit between the amygdala and the hippocampus, okay, when the emotions rule and the person becomes a volcano of action and there is no more planning and no more understanding of that other person being alive and you know, maybe the punishment outweighing the the crime that had been committed. So this is what we don't take into consideration then. We're just into ego wanting now to take revenge. And that's not the path to go at all. So I realized this not just intellectually, I realized this emotionally as well. I completely understood that now. That is absolutely not the path. And it, a violent communication with words is not the path either. Friedrich Nietzsche, I'm reading his autobiography right now, and he was actually in total denial about, he says that, because he's been accused of being verbally violent and, and aggressive and, and bullyish towards humanity in his books, an aggressor of words and accusations, blame it insinuations. And, and downright uh, just um, ridiculing people uh, I I as a means of retaliation. And I see the way he writes about his, his himself, his own person and his life. He, he was in total denial of that fact that he was retaliating with words. So I personally I'm learning from all of this. I'm learning from those people who made mistakes as well as from those people who did walk the right path. I'm learning now dis to discern between the right path and the wrong path. And I'm hoping that I, with my own example, I can get other people to understand this as well. Because I think it is extremely important to use direct examples from life in order to make a particular concept that is rather theoretical be more understood and put it more into practicability because that's what it what it what we're using it for we're using these learning experiences and these new understandings and these new these new abstract concepts of altruism but we need to learn those concepts the best in form of really understandable and outlined examples that are that are that cannot be misunderstood so I'm hoping that what I'm explaining for my own life, these, this becoming process, that this makes sense and that this can be understood, that the concept that I'm trying to teach that stands behind it becomes more outlined and more, and more visible and more understandable towards its application, towards its actual practicability for us to use, for us to integrate and, and, and be and use as a, not as a template, but as a reminder of when we come across certain situations that w it will remind us, ah, oh, we learned this, Nicola learned this, why do I need to reinvent the wheel? So if you come across a situation where you are bullied, you have certain path that you can go from that fork road. Okay. You have a fork of four spikes, yeah. four roads, or five roads, or maybe more that you can take from there, from that pivotal point. 
and it is absolutely critical for your life and also for the life of planet Earth, which fork road we turn into. We don't want to go into a maze garden with a dead end street. We don't want to do a roundabout way and that will take so long that in the meantime things will get damaged. We want to take the fastest, safest, most elegant and most life-supporting path there is. And that is the path of the Buddha for sure. So, And that's what needs to be taught in schools, not some Babylonian warmonger sage uh, tales uh, that make absolutely no sense. We, we, I, we don't need to hear about Ham and his sons who got banned into damnation because they saw their dad drunk on, on the bed. We don't need tales of, um, of, a, of a father willing to sacrifice his child to his Christian God. We don't need these things. We don't need to hear about, about all these Herodot or whatever their names are who are killing babies and why dwell again and again in these stories that may not even be true or partly true or mostly wrong or whatever it, it doesn't have any reference to and it doesn't even have a, a value of parable anymore for us there isn't even any any ethical value in it any ethical morals that are being in, in somehow existent in this. There's nothing in these stories other than that terrible religion that was written by people in power and, and Rudolf Steiner, he wants to mix that all together and he wants to mix the, the Gnostic part that is the Gnostic relig religious part that, that that has a lot to do with with pagan wisdom and Far Eastern wisdom and and has a, a lot to do with more with real pondering and philosophy. He mixes mixes that in with the religious dogma that was written by people in in power or that were rewritten by people in power. Mix that all together and then. What is what are the children supposed to learn from this? Are they learning any real values? Are they learning altruism and and true love? And I remember right of school, it, what they they had this poem that we were reciting every day, like giving and taking is the life, you know. And see, that's another misunderstanding. Yeah, giving and taking, it should be in a flow of metabolism, of course. But then it gets misconstructed by selfish people and they think, oh yeah, I need to also, I need to also take, you know. And I hear so many people then saying, oh yeah, taking is okay, Rudolf Steiner said so. So that's a misunderstanding right there. There's the hummingbird. It's so cute. <laughs> and the other bird is looking at the hummingbird. He's looking like, who is that? That's so cute. So, yeah, and it, the emphasis should be on giving. Altruism is giving. Yeah? Altruism. Alter means the other. Okay? I'm giving to the other, not to myself, not the me, me, me anymore. Okay? giving and taking as um, as in a form of flow of life and metabolism that is that's just the law of life of course I take too I have to eat and all of this I have to feed myself I have to be very good to myself but then it gets misunderstood by selfish egoic minds by the egos themselves by the concept ego you know, the hungry ghost energy 
that, that then justify and think that taking is good, selfishness is good. Even Esther Hicks has the nerve to, to say to people, selfishness is good. You know, it gets misunderstood. I, I think uh, if, I don't know how she really means it. I'm not so sure about, about that person at all. But it gets certainly misunderstood, you know, and that's why there's no way we can teach something like this. No chance. Giving and taking, you know, you give, I take. You know, it's like a deal. It's all a deal. The law of nature and attraction, it's all a deal? No, it's not. Okay? It's absolutely not. People misunderstand it all the time. Particularly under the Jiddu Krishnamurti video. I see it I see people misunderstanding the concept altruism all the time. Whether it's a, it's a libertarian or an atheist or a Christian, each of them have a different concept of things, but always manage to make to to create a justification for selfishness in the end again you know it's funny how that works and there's a lot of buddhists who in the end um, fabricate their justification for selfishness too in the name of buddhism that's a that's a real that's a real insult to to infinity to do something like this. And it's an insult to metabolism, flow of life. Because it's a complete misunderstanding and it is an, a totally intellectually dishonest way of living and um, a dishonest way of conducting things and communication. Because we, ha we have to always take into consideration that what we do, particularly when we are interacting with another human, that this other human is somehow going to learn from our actions in some way f or shape. You know. So, and it, and also, the animals they they will not learn direct not in that way to to be rude to, particularly not with words, but they an animal in, in someone in, in, in the vicinity of an egoic person will become either scared or neurotic too. So and and maybe sometimes even might even go to the point where the where a dog also will become aggressive to others if the caregiver of the dog is aggressive and and teaches with this type of energy and type of aggressive behavior. So in that sense, uh, the dog w might also learn it in, in, the, in the very wrong way. What's ve very dangerous is when, we, when people act selfishly among teenage humans and they learn then to think that is the, the philosophy of their lives. So this is, v this is very, this is a, this is very critical that we set the right rails, you know, that we set the right groundwork for each other, that we be good role models, and and set the right environment for those who are still young and who are confused and who are find, trying to find themselves and the meaning of their lives and all of this. So. All of this is very critical and very, very important is from, that's what I learned from my own experience, is that a school class should not have more than 10 children. There should not be more than 10 people in this one class, or in general, not just for kids, but also adults and later on of course if you're in an auditorium in a university that's a different story because that's that's not interactive that's just l that's just listening and and taking notes 
but this can all be done on the internet anyway. We don't need auditoriums anymore, really. We can have all of this aired on the internet. And people should now get into learning on the internet. And schools should be conducted on the internet in general. And we need more homeschooling. And uh, a school in general should not have more than 10 kids. And then I also would definitely not mix these different kids together. Rudolf Steiner, he tried to mix everything together. It was his, what he understood from the far, he, he's been in India, and what he understood from the, from the Far Eastern philosophies is this, we need unity, but he misunderstood it. He can't be just throwing everybody together and then have the, the vulnerable child become the victim of the bullies. That's just not going to work. We have to even imprison the people now, now, not to do these kind of things. So that's why people are quite strictly uh, routed towards their own groups, because otherwise they'll be shredding each other apart. And because in prison most people are bullies, you know, most people are violent. Uh, or sadistic, or um, just uh, bypass the prefrontal cortex. So that's wha also what Adrian Rain is talking about in his words. We need 10 children in one classroom, and the teacher should be a therapist also. The teacher should be highly trained in correctly dealing with sensitive people, and the highly sensitive students should only get a highly sensitive teacher. So teacher with HSP should have HSP students. Uh, a teacher, the regular person should have regular students. And yeah, and, the, and they should all be highly trained in psychology and in, in counseling and in, in therapy work. And when a student cries, the, the, they shouldn't be shut up. They should be listened to, and they should be allowed to cry. And they should have also facilities where they could go into a soundproof room and scream and pound against the wall. And, but what's really critical is that after that is steamed out, they need to be ho held, they need to be hugged, they need to be petted or massaged, they need to be given a lot of love. And that's the only way we can begin to heal. So I have, uh, I, I mentioned a lot of concepts now that can be applied for future work, for future educational pedagogic skills and development. And I hope that some people will pick up on it and and utilize that and and use it and bring these I integrate these ideas into new pedagogic settings so anyway take care everybody bliss out peace out <laughs>